Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Rerooted Podcast. I'm your host, Francesca Maxime. It is May 23rd, and it is um, continuing to be a fluctuating kind of spring weather pattern here. Um, But we all have our internal uh, fluctuations, and and we definitely have... um, parts of us that are sticky and muggy like it is out today. And then we also have parts that get hot and there are parts that get a little bit cool. And when we're really looking at this um, rerouting, unearthing our natural radiant brilliance and really connecting and sharing and looking at all the roots that we share in our interconnectedness, uh, one of the pioneers, I think, of really what it means to be relational in a human embodied way, not necessarily in a Arbor Day tree kind of way, is Terry Real. He is an internationally recognized family therapist, speaker, and author. He founded the Relational Life Institute, offering workshops for couples, individuals, and parents around the country, along with a professional training program for clinicians wanting to learn relational life therapy. I have benefited from his work and from his books, uh, which include How Can I Get Through to You? I Don't Want to Talk About It, and The New Rules of marriage. Terry Real, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate seeing you again. Yeah, it's always fun, Francis. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And in today's conversation, as I was mentioning off uh, camera before we started, I'd like um, to just let people know they can learn a lot about uh, relational therapy by going to your website and by taking your classes and by watching other podcasts. But for today's purposes, I'd really like to dig in a little bit more toward your own personal journey and how you show up in your own life and the kinds of ways in which you've become more relational with yourself mm-hmm. and how that's been able to enable you to be more relational with those that you encounter that you maybe like or don't like so much, but can still stay in your seat and be relational with. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> what do you want to know? I'm an open book. Right. So in this first book, I don't want to talk about it, which talks about um, male depression, which I think was really not only pioneering, but also really, um, and still is helpful for people. Um, it came out of your own pain, of your own childhood wounds with your own dad. And um, I find so many people continue to carry that burden and um, don't realize that there's a way in which it can be worked with. So how are you able to start to work with unpacking some of your alcoholic father, your abusive situation, willing to be courageous enough. And there's a beautiful passage that you say that you stop the flames. You can probably quote it better than me um, so that it doesn't continue to overtake sort of the wildfire of the forest of your life and then sort of burn everything else up in its path. Yeah. Uh, okay. So just for the record, my dad, uh, of the many things he was, was not alcoholic. He was oh, spared, okay. spared us that. But he was a depressed angry, rageful guy, and not all that fun to be with. My father. Uh, but you see, even though my father was uh, emotionally and at times physically violent, uh, he was also the nurturing one in the family. And he was warm and loving, and it was all uh, very confusing as it is when you have a loving parent who's episodically turning on you. And um, I was totally enmeshed with both parents, but particularly my father. You can tell when a child is enmeshed because they use this phrase, I felt sorry for my parent. When my father was beating me, I felt sorry for him. I felt like he was pathetic. And the whole thing was just so sad. I could just, and it did. I would just take to my bed and be depressed. You're not, a child is not supposed to feel sorry for a parent. A parent is supposed to be bigger than that. A parent is supposed to be bigger than the child, not the other way around. 
So there was a legacy of violence. In some ways, I've said, uh, Francesca, my whole life has been a Zen Cohen on power, particularly male power. And I grew up with a horrible, distorted, grotesque version of masculine power. Mm. And for many years, I tried to divest of my own power. Uh, and it's only in the last few decades that I've come into right relationship with it. I had to become a therapist. I had to become an individual therapist in order to have the conversation with my dad that I needed to free myself of him. And then I had to become a family therapist to learn how to have, be intimate and have relationships. You know, there's a, what's the old line? Therapists are people who need to be in therapy 40 hours a week. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, uh, so I had to figure this out. It, 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 my topic sentence was like the, I had to understand, I had to come to an understanding of my father so that I would not become him. Mm. And I knew that in my bones, I knew that. Mm. And in terms of spirituality, in my own case, I, um, I had the gift, the grace of a nascent sense of spirituality ever since I've been a little boy. Mm. It's, it's what gave me um, solace and love. In How did you that sense that as a child? How did you connect with that? Where was that for you? Was it nature? Was it animals? Yeah, it was nature and it was alone. I would walk in the woods for hours and hours and hours and sing a little song. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine that I was a superhero being a little boy mm -hmm. and that uh, light could come out from my hands. I've since heard healers speak about how their hands get warm when they do work. Um, you know, there's that thing in Freud, the family romance. You think that um, this isn't your real family. It's Oliver Twist. Your real family is the royal family or whatever. Mm. I had a family romance. I believed, and I firmly believe this, um, that this wasn't my real planet, mm. that I didn't belong here at all and that I was a different being from a different place. And that someday, I had this recurring fantasy, uh, a spaceship would come from my home planet and take me back. You know, and I really just want to bookmark this because we hear so many people talk about how people get lost in daydreams or they're dissociated or they have these other like problematic sort of disordered patterns of thinking. Another way of thinking about it, which is the way I'm thinking about it, and I know you see it, is how resourceful, how beautiful, how, how creative, how thoughtful for a child to really reckon with the reality of what's in front of them, which is this um, violent father, as you said, but also loving, and just sort of being confused with that, and then stepping into the resources of the land and nature and all of what's abundant around you to support this energy of feeling inside and then come up with this superhero, this one that has this alternate universe that knows that there is somewhere a safe space, even if it's in it, within me. I always knew that. I always knew that the way it was in my childhood was not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe this is gendered. Maybe this is because I was a boy. Um, but certainly there are a lot of boys who don't do this. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I knew that it was them and not me. I, I, I didn't take in a lot of shame. I knew that they were crazy. Mm. And, uh, I went through all you go through when you're a little child with two gigantic crazy people raising you. Um, but I didn't take it in as if, it, I didn't take in their attacks as if they were real. I knew they were nuts. But I also knew that there was something better. And like a lot of kids from top families, uh, I was a very good surrogate. I hung out at other people's families. I got myself invited to dinner. I, I saw what normal families look like. And I knew that I wasn't in one. And it was just like serving prison. It was just serving time until I could get out and be out from under. Yeah. 
and and finding those like you say those um those figures that we can you know sort of we chose we, we now i did nowadays i think it's the chosen family verbiage right that's what people say when they find people who can be nourishing in their lives and not just the ones who perhaps are biologically connected but have more of them yes yeah. i i supplemented with a lot of other parents and i'm a great mentee i've had a lot of mentors over my and one of the things that growing up in a really dysfunctional family does get you often is you're um, you're very adoptable. Uh, you learn to be pleasing and to uh, be invited to other situations because the one you're in is so hard. Mm. Was there a sense of you about that, though, that was needing to be affirmed in that way? Or were you just really sort of, because you said you're not so shame-based, although I know that later you said in life as an adult you became a little bit more on the grandiose side of things. Yeah, right. I'm right. not based on grandiose things. <laughs> that up, Francesca. <laughs> Sorry, not my problem. Right, no. Well, I mean, we're talking about this stuff, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, it's true. I did go up in the grandiosity like my old man. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I, I didn't go into shame, and I, I always knew they were nuts and not to be trusted. I, I do want to say something about my spiritual journey, though. I hate, I hate that word journey, but um, I uh, I now am in a group called Diamond Heart. I don't know if you know it. Ridwan, it's uh, uh, the leader is a man named H. H. Almas. He's a uh, yeah. And that's my practice now. I've had a very checkered career in spirituality. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but I remember I was sitting in retreat with uh, the other local Diamond Heart people. We were in a big circle together. And I shared this memory of my childhood. It was very touching, actually. And I said to the group, I think this is the spaceship, and I think you were the people. Yeah, gets to be. Yeah. Exactly that. So it's been a long, hard climb, man. A long, hard climb. And here we are. But I also want to say something about meditation. I've meditated on and off for over 40 years. And um, oh, it's very sweet to see you here. Um, I think the first time I felt, well, not the first time, but one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life of being loved. Uh, is through meditation. And uh, I experienced presence as, it's interesting, I sat in Zen for a number of years, and it was pretty abstract for me. It doesn't have to be. Uh, there are all sorts of ways to do it, but it was pretty abstract. And I, I would get high as a kite, but it was very kind of impersonal. Since I started doing Diamond Heart in particular, which is more Sufi, um, when presence comes to me, it feels like a presence. It feels like a being. Mm -hmm. It's not an impersonal abstraction. It's a living, loving force. Uh, Almas talks about living daylight. He says living daylight is the first spiritual experience that most people have. And you just, you, you experience the light as alive. You experience spirit as alive and intelligent and benevolent and loving. And as I allowed that love to penetrate me through years of meditation, uh, there was a fulcrum that got passed and I shifted from a legacy of basic mistrust from my childhood to a legacy of basic trust. I, I feel that the universe, you know, one of my favorite quotes is they asked Albert Einstein late in his life, a journalist, 
80s or 90s. From this perspective, what is the most important question in life? And they expected some E equals MC2 thing. He said, the most important question in life is this, is the universe a friendly place? And like a lot of spiritual people, my universe was not a very friendly place growing up. And it only really became a friendly place through my spiritual practice. And uh, I feel like I believe uh, that there's a benevolent spirit that is very tuned in to Terry Real, just like it's tuned into Francesca Maxima and everybody else on the planet. And it means me well. It's not. There's a great line in um, James Joyce's Ulysses. Stephen Daedalus is talking in his, his Joyce's stand in, his alter ego. He's in a bar, a pub, and he's going on about God. And somebody says to him, Oh my God, a man of your intelligence, you can't possibly believe in a personal God after uh, all of your education. And Daedalus says, You know, if you uh, see a, a being, as omnipresent, omniscient, and uh, omnipotent, I would at least expect him to be a person. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really that. It was being touched in this very personal way that has shifted my world from a kind of guarded mistrust, I have to admit, although I've certainly worked on it, to um, benevolence. Hmm. And that benevolence um, is both in the trust of receiving it from this presence, from this embodied um, sense of, you know, goodness, but also the benevolence that then you're able to offer to others, right? As opposed to them being in this place of being more grandiose, to use your terminology, or otherwise one up, you know. And yeah. that, those are all defenses, you know, healthy defenses, adaptations to you know, sort of get us through until we know how to do differently and experience differently and move through the world differently. But that the impact is both in the receiving and in the sharing and what we're offering. Well, yeah. I mean, what's interesting is I've really become an intimacy merchant. I am, I sell intimacy. And I'm obsessed with uh, intimacy and relationality. And uh, it's been a long struggle for me to be intimate, uh, as is true for most people talking about intimacy in the field. Uh, Belinda Berman uh, has been the greatest teacher, and my kids have far and away been the greatest teacher. Yeah, they, uh, uh, they regularly confront my imperfections. And... Um, regularly confront the imperfect way I deal with their confrontations. And so they've really taught me how to be a better husband-father unit. And in that teaching, uh, I've learned a lot about how to be more intimate. And I feel like I've been healed. Yeah. That's both ways. But I will say as a teacher and a therapist, there is a kind of, a, everybody knows this, but there's a kind of flow state that you get into on a good day. And that is very spiritual to me. I, I feel like I'm not working, I'm channeling. I agree. And how do you feel, feel that in your body? Because I know for me, when some of my clients are doing a big piece of work, and frankly, one of them um, last week did a couple you know, sessions um, where I was doing as you as you teach to, to really do that inner retrieval work alongside the partner. And um, really working with the parts of her that were left, and that are feeling continuously alone and abandoned in present day, and um, you know, really challenged with the ways in which she was having to navigate when her partner currently would have to leave and then come home and do trips and come back, and, and that that was really challenging. But that being right there, as you say, in I call it being in the pocket. You what? Being in the pocket. Oh, good. Being in the pocket. Yeah, being in the pocket with the person, you're in the flow with the person doing their work, that 
what emerges is relational, witnessing, held, connected, together. Yeah. Well, what you get when you're in that flow state is you get the exact thing that you need in that moment to make your next move, to crack them open or help them be closer or drop the defenses and relax or whatever it is. You know, we're, our, we're, we're the only instrument we have, we therapists. We are our own instrument. And how you position yourself, the energy that you bring, your presence, um, where you kind of throw your weight at any given, I think you can really work this out. I think you should probably break up. Where, where you throw your weight, you are your instrument. And um, all forms of therapy say, oh, it would be a good idea if you did this. But in RLT, we say, you have to do this work inside yourself or RLT won't work. Uh, as you know, RLT, relational life therapy, is uh, very confrontational. It's lovingly confrontational, but it's in your face about what you're doing. There are three phases to RLT, if I can say this. The first is waking up the client. That's the, the loving confrontation phase. Do you know that the last five men that you picked were all abusive in exactly the same way? Can we talk about number six for a moment? You know, it's it, you tell somebody what they're doing that's blowing their own foot off, which I think a lot of therapy doesn't do. It shies away from because they're afraid of offending the person or hurting it. Yeah, we're taught to be nurtured. Endless therapy equals nurture. Endlessly nurture. And RLT doesn't work like that. We are nurturing. That's sort of the, the, the foundation. You have to have that. We're very empathic therapists. Um, but it's, it's the requirement. It's not the change agent itself. The change agent is what you do once you have the relationship with the client. So what we do is uh, confront you about your relational stance that's getting you into trouble. Then we take that stance up a generation. Where did you learn to do this? Where did you learn to pursue somebody by screaming at them? Where did you learn to uh, leave in a huff and just walk out? Where did you learn to, whatever the dysfunctional stance is. And of course, there's always resonance up a generation of some kind. You have to look for it sometimes, but it's always there. And then we do inner child work. We do family of origin work in the presence of the other partner sitting in the room. And then the third phase is education. Uh, a lot of trauma people believe that once you remove the trauma, people will just sort of naturally know how to be intimate with each other. I don't believe that's true. I don't either. It's not my experience. No. We have very high expectations of relationships now. We need a high level of skill to pull that off and um so we teach people how to fight clean how to stand up for yourself with love how to uh, respond but even that how to fight clean how to stand up for yourself with love fighting clean means that it's okay to have there be a rupture that ruptures are part of the picture too that that's allowed that we're making space for the fact that not everything is supposed to be at some static always blissful state all the time yeah, and yeah. the part about standing up for yourself is I have needs and preferences, or preferences and wants, and it's okay for me to be boundaried or requesting about what that means and then check in with what does it mean when I reach out and I ask for something? What did I learn about why I retract and why I don't, but then I hold down and I get resentful and I don't feel like I can speak my voice? And then moving into the space of titrating that maybe a little bit at a time to try, right? You don't just always ask for the new car every day, right? But whatever it might be, but that that is that process of recognizing things like boundaries. Where does this come from? Is this mine or is this what's here right now with this person? Or is this really just an opportunity for me to explore and unpack this kind of old stuff? Yeah, well, there are, there are always opportunities to explore. Every moment is that. Sometimes Belinda and I look at each other and smile and one of the others will say, uh, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to work on myself. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't go over very well when we do that, but we still do it. Anyway, um, the thing is that all relationships, I got this from Ed Tronic, the Harvard uh, observational, the infant observational researcher. 
when you put a camera in front of mothers and babies, they don't look like uninterrupted bliss. There's an endless dance of harmony, disharmony, and repair. Closeness, disruption, return to closeness. And Tronic believes, and I follow him, that this is the basic rhythm of all relationships. Uh, and I speak about the harmony phase, the disillusionment phase, and the mature love phase. And in that first phase of relationship, I call that love without knowledge. You have a soul connection with the person. You know, Belinda knew she was going to marry me after our first conversation. She, she knew that, but she was completely unprepared for the quality of my closet floor or <laughs> what I do with my bank account. Um, that love without knowledge, that harmony phase, of course, that's what everybody idealizes, and that's our culture's ideal of what a relationship is supposed to look like. That's absolute nonsense. The second phase is disillusionment. Knowledge without love. Now you can see very clearly what your partner's imperfections are, and you don't like them at all. And then the fourth phase, the third phase is acceptance, mature love. Now you see all about your partner's imperfections. You know them all very well. And they're really a pain in the ass. You're not going to minimize that, but it's worth it. I want to write a memoir of my marriage. I probably never will, but I, I tease about writing it. And I want to call I have a title for it. I want to call it A Fight Worth Having. Beautiful. Thank you. Because that's what a relationship is. It's not harmony. It's a fight worth having. Yeah. I love that because it's, um, I think it's, uh, you know, another famous book is, you know, folks, the top ones who said something along the lines of, you know, marriage is about growth. You know, it's, it's about growth, which is kind of what you're saying. Like, thank you for this opportunity to, whatever, deal with my shit, you know, <laughs> basically. Yeah. I was just on the call with a student talking about this. You know, there's a lot in the field right now about, um, it, with all the attachment stuff, that we can heal each other. And I think we got to be very careful about that. Uh, you're not my responsibility to heal. I'm not your responsibility to heal. Uh, the only person who can really be there for those inner children is me, not my partner. And I think it's really important to say, yes, your partner can love those inner children and heal uh, by being nurturing to those wounded places. But they're not obligated to. That's not their responsibility. It's just a nice thing that happens when mm. grown-ups are open-hearted with each other. And and can it not be then the opportunity for the therapist, not so much in, in different ways of therapy, but different kinds of emphasis on um, the relationship between the client or patient or person, student, whatever it is, and the, and the therapist. Um, but that that can be the holding space for the person to find a connection, but that it's there for that period or for that time, but that the person's real inner attachment work and real inner reconciliation work, real forgiveness work, uh, is within the corridors of their own experience about their own stuff. And that it can be held in this sort of amniotic fluid, if you will, for a little while of the, of the you know, curiosity of a, of a compassionate therapist, but not, that, that that's not it. That well, it can, it can be. I mean, there is transference-based therapy. I don't do it. I used to. And I don't really believe in it that much because it, it does work. The way it works is through, uh, the way traditional therapy works is the therapist is a blank screen. I project onto that blank screen all my negative expectations about how I'm going to be treated from my family. You treat me discrepantly. You're not harsh like my father. You're kind. You're not controlling like my mother. You're permissive. Whatever the, the therapist is more sane than your family was, and you have these discrepant experiences that they call corrective emotional experiences. And over time, I did this. I was in three day a week psychotherapy for five years, traditional analytic. My therapist loved me, and over five years, I internalized his kindness, and I did become a smidgen kinder to myself. That 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 work does work. It just takes, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And I think there's a lot more direct. I can teach you how to be more loving to yourself 
without going through the whole rigmarole of the corrective emotional experience. Yeah. I'm not here to provide a corrective emotional experience between you and me. I'm here to provide a corrective emotional experience between you and you, and right. between you and the people you love. That's what I'm here for. Right, a hundred percent. And 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 I orient in that way also. And I think that the one thing that enables people to perhaps um, be willing to go there is just that they do feel that there's a little bit of safe space here in order for them to be able to start to dig internally. Right? Yes, that has to be there. Uh, that, yeah. The empathy, the connection, all of that good stuff that everybody's talking about, all of that has to be there. The difference between RLT and other forms of therapy is we say that is necessary but not sufficient. Loving somebody is not enough to change them. You know, there's more work involved. Than just yeah, one. because it, it it opens the door to learning what it's like to love yourself with all of the you know old catastrophe of whatever we're holding. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I teach people very actively to stand up to negative self-talk and to appreciate that that's a child part of them that's speaking. It's the what we call the adaptive child part that internalized all this harshness and it's now discharging it. And um, there's a two-step, this is one of millions of tools, but there's a two-step process. One is you lean into the negative talk, not harshly. You don't need harshness with harshness, but with loving firmness. And you say something like, hey, listen, little Terry, like, I, I know, I know you're trying to steer the ship here, and you're just standing up for standards of excellence and all the rest of it. But could you pipe down and let me finish this sentence without all the static? I'm, I'm trying to write here. Mm -hmm. So the first step is to sort of settle that down. And then the next step is to actively summon the energy tenderness towards yourself and give it to yourself. And this is a practice. A healthy self-esteem is being able to hold yourself warmly in the face of your imperfection. Right. And I teach people how to do that. In transference space work, it takes 20 years and you internalize it through the relationship with me. In RLT, it takes about two months and you learn how to do it yourself. Right. No, I, I, I love it. It's so effective. And it reminds me of the whole idea of, um, you know, in, in the Buddhist teachings, as I'm sure you know and, and, and I'm aware of, you know, it's like inviting Mara for tea. We turn toward that which is difficult. Um, we turn, you know, Mara, the, 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 the devil figure, the evil, you know, figure, the tempter, the one who always wants to muck things up, that instead of saying, you know, oh God, I'm afraid of you. Oh, I'm afraid you know, like you're horrible, but that we actually like invite him in and have tea. And I think it's Sharon Salzberg that tells the story that, you know, she was relating this uh, teaching to someone and she said, well, can I, can I give him a to-go cup and can they hang out on the, on the, on the porch for, <laughs> for something for now? And she was like, okay, if that works. But that's the beginning of the process, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah, willing, people they are. I'm willing to be with this enough just to open, you know, I will open the door. I will give them some tea, but they're not going to hang out in my living room forever. But eventually, becoming to make friends with them may sort of decalcify their monstrosity, the inner child, you know, that I'm talking about in this analogy. There was a, a tribe, um, uh, I forget the name, but there was a, a native indigenous people in uh, the South Pacific, and they did lucid dreaming. Do you, have you ever heard of lucid dreaming? And the, the guy told a story, it, the whole village would process the dreams that they all had and give advice about what to do because they would repeat it. Mm -hmm. uh, the story he gave was his own child came to him and he was being chased by a tiger and the whole village met and they told him what to do and they, and, and they told him to surround himself with allies and friends and stand still, not to run. And he did. He had a circle of big, powerful people between him and the tiger, and he just stood there, and the tiger relaxed. And then, little by little, he befriends the tiger. The tiger takes him on his back, and he goes on a ride, and then at the very end, he asks the tiger for a gift. And the tiger gives him a unique gift. And this is the way these Indian, these Native people deal with dreams altogether. Yeah. What you're saying is what what it was capsulized by a client of mine. He just said his life changed when he learned at the minute to minute level to steer into the storm. Yes. Steer into the storm. Yes. And that's what is so 
rich about, I mean, I even can call it, I mean, I've sort of called it applied mindfulness. How can we be with what's here? How can we allow what's here? How can we not say, oh, I co-sign this, I'm in love with this, but this is what's here too. This too. This is how I'm feeling about what's here. This is what I prefer to be here. Sure, fine. But this is what's here too. Well, you know, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Suzuki Roshi, the, the great California Zen master. And I'll, ma I'll mangle it, but he says something like, all human beings want to avoid suffering. What we don't understand is that suffering is how we live. Suffering is how we grow. And when you look at imbalance as the thing itself, it is a source of great suffering. But if you see imbalance as silhouetted against unchanging Buddha nature, against the big picture, then this suffering that you're in the middle of is an enfoldment in something that is perfectly balanced. Mm, yeah. And I think to really steer into the storm requires some modicum of spirituality. You have to believe in some kind of basic trust in order to have the courage to steer into the storm because if you don't have some sense of benevolence that you're taking in with you, uh, it's just too overwhelming to bear. Yeah, and I love that you're really naming that explicitly because I feel the same way and I know from my own personal experience, without that, I wasn't able to face my demons, but it all happened overnight, right? Like it, it sort of, everything changed. I didn't know what to do. And finally, there was... Um, it was a book, actually, that um, someone had given me called well, There's Nothing Wrong With You, A Guide to Getting Over Self-Hate. And it was a book by a woman named Sherry Huber. And it was, um, she's a social Zen practitioner. And it was like, wait, what? Like, this is conditioning? Like, yeah. it's imprinting and neurobiology and, you know, neurons and, all, you know. And that's why when I say I have awareness and can make a choice, there's a part of me that isn't really making the choice I want to make or continues to do the same patterning or whatever. And once that happened, that was the foundational piece, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like, there's nothing wrong with you. Then came in the piece of, oh, there's the nature. There's basic goodness. What's that about? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there really are two ways to walk around in the world. There's a, a walking around with, some degree of um, confidence in your own power to be successful in benevolence of whatever, whoever is going to re receive you. And the other way is to walk around guarded and mistrustful and defensive, compensating with a lot of grandiosity and all that stuff that we do. It's all well and good for us to say to our clients, you know, steer into the Sure. But a lot of our clients have never had somebody put their arm around them, metaphorically, have never had somebody at their um, had their back. And um, that's where we come in. Yeah. We give them the the adult ego, we give them the spiritual power to I was talking to one, uh, I did an interview, and a woman was talking about how it was much easier to get angry than to get vulnerable. Yeah. And she said, I said, what's so tough about vulnerability? And she said, well, I might get hurt. You may not come through for me, and I might get hurt. And I said, and I said that's right. That's called sustainable hurt. I call that sustainable hurt. Mm. And if you want to engage, you're going to get hurt. That's how this planet works. If you want to be safe, stay in bed all day. Uh, but um, it was the poet David White who said, anything on this planet that's worth loving will break your heart. Yes. But that's okay. It's the broken heart that lets in the light. Yeah. It is the broken heart that lets in the light. Yeah, I can really, really receive that and um, and then share that light with others. Yeah, it's it's so beautiful to talk to you. I know our time is coming to a close and I 
really appreciate your conversation at this level about the ways in which um, really connecting with ourselves and to what you named initially, the presence and trusting that and having that be our guide and having that develop after being in a practice of something, nature, communion with others, but really then having that be part of what you walk around with embodied and allow it. I agree. That that's a game changer. I agree. Well, I'm very grateful for this conversation too. Uh, I I am... Um, I haven't spoke. I've been pretty much in the closet about my spiritual practice for a number of years. I haven't really spoken much about it publicly, but it is an essential aspect of the work that we do and that I teach. Uh, thank you for helping me articulate it. Well, it's my honor and my pleasure, and I and I really do um, feel as though. I have learned so much from you. And you talk about a corrective emotional experience. I mean, I have pulled new fathers from all of you. Know, I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll pick you, I'll pick you, I'll pick you. And that that's okay. You know what I mean? Um, whether virtually or in real life or whatever version of it. Um, because um, I won't get into the whole neuroscience of it, but, but we rock it in a different way. We, we were, we're able to take it in and, uh, and, and shift. And that's what's the important part. So thank you. Yeah. We are each other's best resources. If we allow it. Yeah. Terry Real, everything is at terryreal.com. And um, yeah, I just am so grateful for your presence and for your sharing today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Francesca.